Well, I'm, com I'm completely thrown off. Already I was thinking of a, a joke when I heard that wonderful uh, lecture about illusion today. It's an old German joke about uh, the uh, receptionist, the doctor's receptionist, tells the doctor, she says, there's an invisible man in the waiting room. The doctor says, tell him I can't see him. <laughs> <laughs> This is a joke. Um, you know, I'll, 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 I'll get to it very cleverly, okay? <laughs> That's the towel joke, and I, I, I'm sure to tell it. Back when I was a young man in my 60s, I told the following joke to my lifelong and closest friend, Tom Cathcart. The joke is this. Lenny is in bed with his best friend's wife when they hear the husband's car come in the driveway. Lenny jumps out of bed, jumps into the closet. Just a moment later, the husband comes sauntering in, goes to the closet, and opens up the door. And there he sees Lenny standing there, stark naked. He says, Lenny, what are you doing there? And Lenny says, everybody's going to be somewhere. <laughs> My friend Tom responded by saying, Lenny is giving a Hegelian answer to an existentialist question. I'm sure that's what all of you thought, too. <laughs> what the friend is really asking is, what are you, Lenny, of all people, doing naked in my closet? But Lenny, for obvious reasons, would rather give a, 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 a response at a really high level of abstraction, like Hegel would, and say, everybody's got to be somewhere. I have to back up a little bit to about 50 years ago. That was the, well into the last millennium. Tom and I studied philosophy together as undergraduates over 50 years ago. We were not uh, brilliant students. Uh, not by far. In fact, in, in our tutorial, there were very few people who wanted to study philosophy anyhow, and in our tutorial was the one star of the class, a kind of nerdy guy named David Souter. And, uh, <laughs> Tom would say, he doesn't get it either. So, you know. Anyhow, because of this background, I actually knew what Tom's interpretation meant. It meant, you know, existentialism, when it came along, pretty much, the, you know, it flowered about the time we were in, in college in the late 1950s and early 60s, said philosophy has to come back down to the here and now. It has to come down to the human situation, the problems that face human beings and his consciousness. Uh, and, you know, that's not the direction that philosophy had been going in. The way it had been going in, among other places, was uh, where Hegel took us, who saw, trans took a transcendental view of life, that in every particular situation was reflected the cosmos, the grand scheme of things. And so, you know, for uh, Hegel, you know, everybody has to be somewhere, was deep. So I said to Tom, I said, you know, I bet you there's a book in there jokes that explain philosophical concepts. And Tom said, yes, it'll be a very short book. <laughs> Anyhow, I, per I persisted, and uh, we went away for a weekend with a stack of joke books and a stack of uh, philosophy books, and we came up with a book called Plato and a Platypus Walk into a Bar, Understanding Philosophy Through Jokes. And it worked on this premise, the idea that the construction and payoff of jokes and the construction and payoff of many philosophical concept, concepts are made out of the same stuff. They tease the mind in similar ways. That's because philosophy and jokes proceed from the same impulse, impulse to confound our sense of the way things are, as we saw very much in, in, in that lecture about illusion. And what they do is they flip our word worlds upside down, that's what makes them funny, or that's what makes them interesting, and they ferret out hidden, uncomfortable truths about life. What the philosopher calls an insight, the jokester calls a zinger. 
Well, it turned out that we were even able, when we were putting together this book, we had so much fun doing it, I've got to tell you. Uh, and we think similarly. Tom is a better philosopher than I am. I had a little bit of uh, or, or a substantial background as a jokester, writing jokes for Flip Wilson and various people in New York. And that's what I did with my philosophy degree. And, uh, um, but then, you know, we got to some hard parts. There are a lot of jokes that play on logic, both de deductive and inductive. But when we got into, like, the philosophy of science, it got to be uh, pretty difficult. But a lot of philosophy of science um, has to do with uh, cause and effect. That's my segue. So, so, so this old guy goes to the rabbi and he says, Rabbi, I'm, 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 I'm married to this young woman, and no matter how hard I try, I just can't satisfy her in bed. I just, I just can't do it. The rabbi says, it's a difficult problem. What you do is get somebody to wave a towel over you while you're making love. This, this should fix it up. So he gets the young neighbor boy to do it and waves the towel. He gets in bed with her. She reports that she didn't feel a thing. <laughs> Goes back to the rabbi and he says, what happened? The rabbi says, oh, I'm sorry. He says, that sometimes happens. He says, we're going to make a small adjustment in this. He says, put the young man in bed with your wife and you wave the towel. <laughs> so he follows what the rabbi says. The wife is yelling and screaming. She's ecstatic, and the old guy's waving, waving. Finally, she has her 14th climax, and the old guy says, now that's the way you wave a towel. <laughs> <laughs> I think this speaks to post hoc ergo propter hoc. Yes, right. <laughs> Just because something comes before doesn't mean it's what causes what comes afterwards. Another one, and one that uh, in the philosophy of science that Tom et al. and I had always found interesting, uh, largely because it, it took so long to come to light in the history of science. And that is uh, Karl Popper's, who was not known, Popper, a uh, Viennese uh, philosopher, was not known particularly uh, for philosophy of science, but more for social philosophy. Um, he came up with the idea that you need to do falsification. Uh, there's a test for any scientific hypothesis, and that means there must be, as he called it, the falsification test. There must be some kind of possible or conceivable evidence that will prove the hypothesis wrong. Otherwise, your theory doesn't hold weight. And we looked and looked and looked for a joke, and we found an old British joke that went like this. There were two friends that were having breakfast. They were making toast, and the, the host says, have you ever noticed that whenever you drop a piece of toast, it always lands butter side down? And his friend says, no, it's, it's going to happen equally. He says, you just remember those times because it's such a mess, you have to clean it up. So those are the only ones you remember. And, and, and he says, uh, no, no, you're, you're quite wrong. Watch this. He flips a piece of toast, and it lands butter side up. And his friend says, see, I told you. And the guy says, oh, I see what I did. I buttered the wrong side. <laughs> yeah. So there's no conceivable evidence it's going to disprove his theory. What kind of a theory have you got then? I must say, in the natural sciences, the sciences that most of you practice, you don't see this. You still see it all the time in this, uh, the human science. I hate to call them sciences. The psychology. I, I, there I said it. Psychology. Uh, uh, you know, like um, much of Freud's theories may be very useful. They never worked for me. But... Uh, uh, you know, if you presented to, to Freud somebody who loved his mother, he'd say, uh-huh, Oedipus complex. Somebody who hated his mother, you'd say, you see, he's got, uh, what do they call it, uh, 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 where you switch it around, I've forgotten. Tr uh, I put, yeah, something like that. Anyway, he loves his mother so much he has to turn it around. You know? And then somebody who's indifferent to his mother, he says, aha, uh -huh. he's suppressing his love for his mother. 
There's no evidence that you can give him to disprove the Oedipus complex. You see that often. Um, then, of course, there is a joke that has uh, much of our metaphysics, you know, before modern philosophy, uh, and even in modern philosophy, had to do with the concept of time. You know, is time purely an objective thing, you know, measured by planetary movements and hence clocks, or is it something subjective that, you know, people like Husserl said, it's the way we experience time, which is uh, primary. Well, anyhow, uh, uh, I'm not a scientist, but I was fascinated by this uh, recent uh, discussions about a particle called a neutrino. And apparently this guy, Lorenz, thinks that a neutrino, a certain type of uh, neutrino at least, can uh, move at the uh, velocity faster than the speed of light. All of a sudden, a joke appears in my inbox. This is the joke, colon. Bartender, I'm sorry, we don't serve any neutrinos in here. Next line. A neutrino walks into a bar. <laughs> Fun, isn't it? I don't understand it, but I like it. <laughs> Anyhow, so Tommy and I had uh, wrote this book together, and we had, as I said, uh, lots of fun. And uh, we gave it to my agent, and she sent it around, and 40, 40 publishers rejected it saying that uh, it was very cute and nobody, uh, not an insufficient number were interested uh, uh, in philosophy. So jokes about philosophy or even explaining philosophy was, uh, you know, a, a, a no-go. Then the 41st uh, took it and gave us an advance enough to cover a lunch. And they published it, and three weeks later, it was number three on the Times bestseller list uh, for nonfiction. And that made us, <laughs> yes. And I was in my late 60s. I was an old fart, you know, and, and all of a sudden I, had, I have a, a bestseller. And then it became a bestseller. Often, uh, because I've been writing books most of my adult life, often humor does not translate. If I wrote a funny book in English, I'd sell in England and Australia. Uh, but not anywhere else. But this book, because of the nature of the kind of jokes we were going uh, for, it had no puns in them, because puns, although they're the bulk of jokes, it turns out, do not explain philosophical concepts. So it, everybody uh, translated and became a bestseller in France who liked uh, Jerry Lewis and philosophy, so that was... Uh, and, and, and Israel, because it's full of Jewish jokes, and. Uh, in Catalan, but not in Spanish. We always found that interesting. And then one day I was very excited. It was, uh, became a bestseller in Bulgaria. And I called uh, our daughter, who was in publishing. You know, excited. You always try to impress your daughter. And I said, we became a uh, bestseller in Bulgaria. And she says, that great, Dad. You probably sold seven books. <laughs> <laughs> I, I apologize if there are any Bulgarians here. Anyhow, so then they wanted more books uh, that did the same thing. And my, my, uh, my pal, Tom, is very interested in theology. As a matter of fact, he went to uh, the uh, divinity school uh, several times. He would always have a crisis of faith when it came to ordination. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was sad for him. I was glad, but it was sad. Um, but he wanted to write one about death, well, uh, and uh, philosophy and theology of death. And I'm not for anything. I said, sure. And, and it was interesting for me. The spectrum of, uh, you know, people have been, philosophers have been writing about death uh, pretty much since the birth of uh, philosophy in Athens. And one of my all-time favorites, uh, uh, Epicurus, uh, wrote about death, and I'm, I'm quoting, death is nothing to us since when we are, death has not come, and when death has come, we are not. 
that's pretty good unless you, if you exclude the idea that while we are, we can think about that we won't be. Um, and, and if you move you know, fast forward to uh, uh, more modern philosophers, you know, philosophers after Descartes writing about that, you, of course you, you, you come to a full stop at uh, Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish, not a very cheerful philosopher, who essentially said in books like Fear and Trembling, uh, that you haven't really lived until you've thought about death all the time. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and uh, I never quite wanted that one. But, uh, in between, there are a lot of philosophers like Schopenhauer and the Zen masters uh, who are related. I mean, Schopenhauer had read some of the masters who believed that we could face death with indifference because... All of life is a meaningless illusion anyhow. Not in the epistemological sense you guys meant, but in a value sense. It doesn't mean anything. It has no significance. So Millie accompanied her husband Maurice to the doctor's office because he hadn't been feeling so well. And the doctor gave Maurice a thorough examination and then he sent him into the waiting room and, and called Millie into his office and he says, your husband has a potentially fatal disease brought on by extreme stress. So what we're going to have to do, what we're going to have to do is set up a program for you at home and here's the way it goes. You have to follow it to the letter. You wake him up every morning with a big kiss and bring him breakfast in bed. And then during the day, don't argue with him even if he criticizes you. Just always keep a nice smile on your face. When he wants to watch sports on TV, even if it interrupts your favorite program, just go cheerfully along with that. Make him his favorite dinner every night. And then after dinner, if he has some little funny whim, you know what I mean, go along with it. Do this every day for the next six months, and I think we can bring Maurice back from the brink of death. On the way home, Maurice says to Millie, what did the doctor say? And Millie said, he says you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> of course, this speaks only to how much we value other people's lives. Not our own, but there is a famous gag from, I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember the Jack Benny show, or, or, or particularly the one on radio, and uh, he was a humorist who was known for his timing, which no one has matched since, in my opinion. And he had a running gag that went like this, and it, uh, uh, Jack Benny is walking, oh, and he's known, and his persona on the radio show, he's, he's a terrible skin flint. So a mugger comes up to him and points a gun at him and he says, your money or your life? Then he stands there and the mugger says, you heard me, mister. Your money or your life? And Benny says, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so he had something that he possibly valued more than his own life. The jokes about the value of other people's lives uh, uh, seem to cover just about every culture and a whole mine of, uh, one nice thing about, a lot of nice things about having written that Plato on a Platypus, but one is, uh, put me in contact with people through uh, book tours and through the, the uh, e email, and so I got turned on to my, you know, I know 4,000 Jewish folk jokes, but I don't know all the other. Well, there are whole libraries of jokes from other places, of course, and some of them surprisingly rich, like Scandinavian jokes. You may have heard some of them from uh, Garrison Keillor. A lot of them feature these two characters called uh, uh, Lena and Ole. So in this one, Lena goes to the Norske Dagblad, to the obituary counter, to report uh, uh, that uh, Ole has died. And uh, the, uh, the obituary editor says, oh, I'm very sorry. He says, what, what do you want it to say? And Lena says, oh. Just say, Ole died. And he says, now, come on, Lena, you know, it's, you were married for so many years, you've, you, you have children, you have grandchildren. 
Ole was very popular in the community. And anyway, if it's money you're worried about, the first five words are free. And then it says, oh, okay, how about, uh, Ole died, boat for sale. <laughs> 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 okay, one more. <laughs> I mean, it seems to be the, the indifference to death, uh, other people's, uh, uh, is, is fodder in all kinds of... Uh, I don't, I don't know, know what the genesis, where this comes from, but it's the story of, of uh, Jack passes away, and they have a funeral service at Woodlawn Cemetery, and a lot of crying and everything, and then they're wheeling the coffin out, and it hits the doorway, and they hear a moaning coming from inside the coffin. They open it up, and there is Jack. He's alive. And he clambers out and goes home with his wife, Jennifer, and 10 years pass. And then Jack dies. And they go back. She goes back to Woodland Cemetery, and at the end of the sermon, they're wheeling the coffin out, and Jennifer says, watch out for the doorway. <laughs> it's awful, awful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, it is not just uh, for, for these philosophers who are much more serious than I, uh, it was not always an easy thing to say that uh, life is always more valuable than death. A lot of them thought that it's worth dying for an ideal. That's what soldiers often do. Um, and, or uh, at the other end, they may think that, let's say, an extreme old age, that there are not a sufficient number of satisfactions left in life so I'd rather be dead. And this is, these have been discussed by all oh, the really smart guys from uh, Seneca, who's an interesting philosopher, Schopenhauer, Albert Camus, who thought that that was the basis of all philosophy. It was the basis of his existentialism. He says there is only one question in philosophy, and that is whether or not to commit suicide. And by that, he meant once you've decided not to commit suicide, if indeed that is your decision, you've decided that there is something of value in living. Now you have to figure out what it is. Um, and of course, uh, when it comes to end-of-life issues, this is where bioethicists, I'm sure many of you work in hospitals where they have a staff of uh, philosophers. Finally, there's something for philosophers to do other than writing jokes. Uh, uh, you know, debate, end-of-life issues. And, um, and, of course, there are a lot of medical ethics jokes. Uh, and I thought you would like to hear some. So Marty goes to Dr. Lewis for a checkup, and after extensive tests, the doctor tells him, I have some really bad news for you, Marty. You only have six months to live. Actually, this one is addressed to the last speaker. Marty is dumbstruck. After a while, he says, that's terrible. I just feel awful. He says, but i got to tell you, I can't afford to pay your bill right now. OK, Dr. Lewis says, I'll give you a year to live. <laughs> In a book that both Larry and I like very much called The Denial of Death by uh, Becker, uh, a late uh, cultural anthropologist from Canada, he won the Pulitzer Prize for the book. He picked up on uh, Kierkegaard's idea that, that, you know, it's fundamental to realizing being your aliveness, your existence, to be fully aware of your mortality. Uh, and he said, uh, he had some interesting ideas about it as an anthropologist. He thought that one of the main functions of any culture is to help us not think about death, to give us some alternative way to think about it so we don't think it is what it is. And uh, you know, the most popular being that we uh, 
gain immortality by going somewhere else after our corporal selves are done. And uh, a big one in our culture, particularly in the secular part of our culture, is that the idea that we will gain immortality by living on through our works and through the memories that other people have of us. Um, I won't tell you what I think of that one, but, uh, but I will tell you a joke. <laughs> so three men are standing around in the, you know, the waiting room of heaven talking about what they'd like to see happen. In their, uh, at their funeral. And the first one says, oh, you know, I'd like to hear somebody say he was a wonderful doctor. He was a great husband and father. He was a, a stellar member of the community. And the second one says, you know, I would like him to, to, to say, you know, his books are immortal. He, you know, his books will be read from time immemorial. Uh, and, and so we will always think of him. And the third one says, you know what I'd like to hear them say? Look, he's moving. <laughs> That's the kind of immortality I'm after. You know, what was it that uh, Woody Allen says? Uh, uh, we had a whole bunch of them. No, I can't. I'm drawing a blank here. Uh, um, I, yeah, I don't want to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Or something. Well, there were a bunch of them. Anyhow, uh, there's a subtle, uh, well, it's, it's, it's consequential difference between the kind of Schopenhauer uh, Buddhist idea of indifference to death because we're indifferent to life, you know, so why would one outweigh the other? And the Old Testament idea that death is just one more thing that happens in life, you know? You know, like you see kids with t-shirts, you know, life's a party, then you die, or something, you know. It's kind of, it's just one more thing. It's not particularly unusual. We aren't gonna lose any sleep about it. It's a fact of life. But of course, that gives rise, uh, you know, to a kind of uh, uh, a blasé attitude towards death in, in, uh, among uh, some Jews. And one of my favorite, this is one of my all-time favorite stories, and it's awful. Prepare yourself for awful. A couple in their 80s go to the rabbi and say they want to get divorced. And the rabbi says, really? You've been, you've been married for 60 years? You've been married all this time? Why get divorced now? And the wife says, well, you know, Rabbi, actually, we've been wanting to get divorced for a long time, but we wanted to wait until the children were dead. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's terrible. <laughs> I wish I hadn't told it. it was, yeah. Okay, I'll give you the more benign one, and the more benign one is about old Saul Bloom lying in his deathbed. He sniffs. It's his wife's strudel. She's making strudel. And he calls to his little granddaughter. He says, I smell grandma's strudel, Zadie strudel, uh, Bubba's strudel. Go, go get the strudel from the, for me. She goes down. She comes back a little while empty-handed. And Saul says to her, says, honey, where, where, where's the strudel? And the little girl says, grandma says it's for after. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of skipped over it before, but most modern religions, most of the religions that have survived in the world today, uh, the way they deal with the, the Becker problem of what, what are we going to do if we do face death as a reality, uh, they, is an afterlife. And it has uh, different names in different religions. It's, uh, it's very popular in uh, most Christian faiths, I think just about all of them, in the Muslim faith. Uh, a lot of primitive religions, you know, happy hunting grounds. I, mean, I, I once made a list of all the names that have then come into English. Heaven, Valhalla, that was in the, uh, uh, the Nordic uh, uh, mythology. Shangri-La, Beulah Land. Isn't that a beauty? I love that one. Um, but in virtually all of them, 
Uh, as a matter of fact, I have not found an exception to it. There are qualifications for getting into heaven. Not everybody gets in. And usually it has to do with whether you've been good or bad. So if Freud's notion that we joke about those things that make us most anxious is true, and I think it probably is, it's little wonder that the subjects of sex and death produce the greatest volume of jokes. And within death jokes, it seems to me, and this is not an exhaustive survey, the most, and, the, and, and a lot of the funniest ones, have to do with whether or not you qualify to get into the afterlife, or at least the good version of the afterlife, heaven. Here's one, and it's a setup in, in many of these jokes, so it must be preying on people's minds, so to speak. And uh, uh, so a man arrives at, at the, at the Golden Gates, and St. Peter says, he says, you know, uh, God and I have been looking over your life, and we can't really make a determination here whether or not you uh, qualify. You know, is there any story you can tell us that, you know, would tip it in the right direction so we know that you qualify for entry to heaven? And so the guy says, well, he says, there was, it was this time, I'm just tootling around the hallway, and then I see that a gang of motorcycle guys have stopped this woman and are harassing her. So I pulled up my car, I got out, I went up to him, and the leader of this motorcycle gang comes up to me. He's six foot seven, he's got tattoos, he's muscular, he's got one of those nose rings. And I said, leave this woman alone. And the motorcycle guy said, says who? And I said, says me, and I ripped the nose ring out of him. St. Peter says, that is impressive. He says, when did that happen? The guy said, about two minutes ago. <laughs> and then this, there's this one, which I can't resist. It doesn't shed a whole lot of light more on the subject. But I love jokes that have really complicated setups. It's a, a weakness of mine. And so this is a situation, and they all have this idea that St. Peter has different criteria for admission. In each of these jokes, it's adjusted essentially for the joke. And so this one, the, this time, in this joke, the policy is the person who had a really bad day the day they died. They qualify as some sort of grace or charity that they're going to get in. So the first guy comes in. He said, well, I'll tell you what happened, uh, St. Peter. He says, the thing is, I, I suspected my wife of cheating on me. He says, so I came home early. I looked all around. I looked in the closets. I looked under the bed. I couldn't find anybody. I went out on the terrace, and there was a guy hanging from a balcony by his fingertips. He says, so I went inside. He says, and I got a hammer. And I slammed his fingertips, and he fell. However, he fell in a bush, so he was still alive. He says, so I went inside, he says, and, and I picked up the refrigerator, and I threw it on the guy, and it killed him. He says, unfortunately, I had a heart attack picking up the refrigerator, and that's why I'm here. And St. Peter says, well, you know, it's a crime of passion, an awful day. He says, he'll let you in, and he calls up the next guy. So the next guy, the next guy says, uh, he says, I had a really awful day too. He says, you know, I was in my apartment out on the terrace, you know, I was doing my aerobics and I s slipped over the edge and I fell on the floor, uh, you know, uh, one floor down to the terrace below and I was hanging on by my fingertips. Some idiot came out with a hammer Knocked me down, I went down, and then, you know, I, I survived that, and then he threw a refrigerator on me, and I died. St. Peter chuckling, he says, yeah, that's a pretty bad day you get in, too. And third guy comes in, he says, I really had an awful day. He says, picture this, he says, I'm sitting in a refrigerator naked. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. It's one of my favorites. It's not often you get, a, a, you know, an ideal joke has three acts, like a play, and each one gets better. Um, the entire concept of heaven or any kind of afterlife, uh, in, you know, in the sense that we are conscious and conscious of having lived before, that's a key part. Uh, you know, if you come back as a rabbit and haven't, can't remember having been Larry Gold, what good does it do you? Uh, so it's, it's like a lot of these questions uh, in philosophy, and that is, uh, how do you uh, work between faith and reason? And as many people, especially the new atheist people like Sam Harris, uh, the late and great Christopher Hitchens, uh, Dawkins uh, in England, uh, these new atheists, I think they miss something about spirituality, but what they don't miss is if you're going to operate with a rational scientific headset 95% of the time, how do you feel about then switching to faith for the other part of the time? Does it make you feel inauthentic, inconsistent? Um, it happens to be one that I think about a lot. But the crisis between faith and reason is one that has long been with us, and there is one of my all-time favorite jokes that speaks to it, and that's about this man who's walking in the woods. All of a sudden, he trips, and he falls down a well. And he's falling, 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 100 feet, 200 feet. He reaches out, and finally, he latches on to this little spindle of a root, and he hangs on, and he looks up, and all he can see is this circle of life, and he yells, is there anybody up there? Nothing. Silence. Is there anybody up there? All of a sudden, there's a thunderclap. A beam of light shines down the well onto the man. And a big booming voice says, I am the Lord your God. Have faith in me, and I will save you. Let go of the root. Is there anybody else up there? <laughs> now that I'm in my mid-70s, uh, and I'm st still reading philosophy uh, and a bit more seriously than uh, I did in my 60s even, and uh, there's something about facing your mortality that will do that to the man. Like they say, a hanging focuses the mind. And I found myself going back to this Greek guy who I just can't get enough of, Epicurus. And he presided over, no, he didn't preside. He was one of the schools in Athens uh, after Plato, after Aristotle, before Christ. They were all, I mean, at this time in Athens, I mean, if I could have one day in the ceiling or flying around there, it would be good. They each had their schools, the Lyceum, the Platonic Academy, and then this guy Epicurus had the most liberal of them up on a hill. Uh, it's, I, I was recently in Athens, and you can't find it. It's an apartment building there. Uh, uh, he had what he called the garden, and he had no requirements for joining his academy. They just sat at the table and talked. They ate very little, had some wine, had some water. They just talked, and they talked about a particular kind of hedonism, which uh, he believed in, and he had developed, and uh, there's some scholars, uh, there's no certainty about it, that he himself had been in influenced by Buddhists, what, uh, what they called the naked teachers in India. Some Greeks apparently had schlepped up to India and come back with this information for him. And um, because he is a hedonist, because he thinks first and foremost Life is to be enjoyed, and it's to be enjoyed to its fullest. There is no purpose beyond that, but that is a sufficient purpose and a great purpose, and you just have to figure out how to attune yourself to it. Uh, uh, so, you know, then we get this idea, which started centuries ago, that Epicurean means that you like fancy foods. You know, I see on the, the net, you know, epicurious.com is, uh, you know, quail with something. That's not, that wasn't his shtick at all. He was, he was into a very simple life. He thought that the greatest pleasures that you could have were companionship, 
uh, that chief above them, talking about ideas uh, with your friends and entertaining them with an open mind, the ideas. And uh, I don't know, it's a good picture he painted. It, it's one that I'm, I'm very uh, tempted toward. And there, I'm, I'm a bit of a uh, Hellenophile or something. I like Greece. I lived there for a short time in my hippie years. And uh, I've gone back ever since. And I think very much of Epicurus, Epicurus's philosophy has somehow become embedded in the culture. Maybe there are, you know, socio-biological reasons, the climate and the landscape, but somehow the two have combined so that it is very much, particularly in the Euro, uh, rural areas, like the islands, and it's an island to which I always return, same island where I have friends, uh, um, that the Epicurean, uh, Epicurean philosophy flourishes. And, uh, and there's a joke, a Greek joke, uh, that they tell now that explains Epicurus's philosophy. And it's about a Greek-American who's done very well in this country. And he's going for a vacation on one of the Greek islands. He comes along, an old Greek man, and he's sitting on a stone, smoking a cigarette, drinking some ouzo, and watching the sun go down. And he observes behind him a whole grove of olive trees. And he asks the man, he says, who do those olive trees belong to? He says, they go, they're mine, they belong to me. And he says, well, what do you do with them? He says, you know, if I'm hungry, I get one. And he says, don't you realize if you pruned them and you took really, really good care of them, picked them at the peak and put them in brine, you could make virgin olive oil. And they're just crazy about virgin olive oil. In America, you could make a fortune. And the old Greek says, well, then what would I do? He says, well, you could get a really big house into that little, instead of that little spitty you have up there. He says, and you could have servants do everything for you. And the old guy says, well, well then what I would do? What would I do? And the Greek-American says, well, you could do anything you want. And the old Greek says, you mean like sit on a rock and smoke a cigarette and watch the sun go down? <laughs> it's a sweet story. Anyhow, my recent preoccupation about, with old age resulted in um, a little trip I took back to this island, uh, Idra. It's off of Peloponnesia. It, for various reasons, starting with its geography, it has no motor vehicles, which changes just that fact, changes life, uh, uh, it slows life down, it, uh, it gives a different you know, from a Husserlian point of view, it gives live time a whole different pace. You can't get any place in a hurry. You just can't. Uh, it makes visiting different. You know, when you visit somebody, you don't just, hi, you're going to sit down, you'll have a meal, you'll talk, because you've walked for 30 minutes to get there. Anyhow, I went back there and I packed. Um, I didn't bring a Kindle with me. I brought a whole suitcase full of philosophy books. And um, I thought I'd think about being an old guy. And, and it, it started with this kind of admission to myself that I am a geezer, you know, I'm not something else. But I realized how hard it is in my culture here in America to be a geezer. Because if I say to anybody, I'm an old man now, you can't say that. Anymore. No, you're not. 75 is the new 50, or 55, or 35, I don't know what it is. But, you know, People don't want to hear you say that you're an old person. They really don't want to hear that, and they try to talk you out of it. I'm not unhappy about it. You know, I'm glad I'm still here, among other things. And, uh, and, but we're up against that all, all the time. And in fact, if we are no longer striving when we're old, uh, we're told, uh, called cowards. We're giving in. We're giving in. And... Uh, and there's this phrase, I think I heard it or I made it up, I can't tell, that happens when you're old. Uh, and that, that uh, there's something called the new old age. Yeah, the New York Times has a column, a regular column, called the new old age, as if they are reinventing old age. And they say, now is the time to continue the prime of life to the point 
where you do things that you never had time or the, the energy, uh, the impetus of some kind to do before, to learn Italian, uh, to see the pyramids. You see these books, uh, the, you know, the thousand places to see before you die. I don't want to see them. But, 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 uh, and the important one is to finally accomplish the goals that have eluded you for the first 75 years. <laughs> of your life. You know, it's a kind of an achievement bucket list. And uh, that one was really uh, brought home to me in the 50th anniversary report from uh, my college, where they, you know, people write in every five years about, you know, usually some kind of self-appraisal and uh, uh, personal philosophy. And so I'm going to quote from my book, which is quoting from that book here. One classmate, a highly successful lawyer and part-time theater and culture reporter for the Wall Street Journal wrote, every day I think about what I haven't done and I get anxious. That I remain in relatively good health is a great blessing, but it's also part of why I'm not sufficiently driven to finish the novels, essays, and plays stewing in my head. But there's time, I hope. We all hope, don't we? And then he drew his inspiration from Wad's, uh, Longfellow's uh, Moratori Salutamus, a poem he wrote for the 50th anniversary of the class of 1825 of his alma mater, Bowden College. In the poem, Longfellow urges his elderly classmates to keep busy, very busy. Ah, nothing is too late till the tired heart shall cease to palpitate. Cato learned Greek at 80. Sophocles wrote his grand Oedipus. And Simonides bore off the prize of verse from his compeers when each had numbered more than fourscore years. That nothing is too late refrain certainly is tempting. We septuagenarians just might be at the top of our game, our creative juices overflowing. Would Epicurus have us damn them up? Would he have sacrificed the classical masterpiece Oedipus Rex just so Sophocles could sit happily in the harbor? That does sound like a terrible waste. Still, there is no rest for the striver. Just beyond the completion of each goal on our life achievement bucket list looms another goal, and then another. Meanwhile, of course, the clock is ticking, quite loudly, in fact. We become breathless, and we have no time left for a calm and reflective appreciation of our twilight years. No delicious long afternoons sitting with friends or listening to music, or musing about the story of our lives. And we will never get another chance for that. Something else I observed on, uh, I'm out of the text now, I observed on my little so sojourn was how often I saw men playing together. I'm sure those of you who've lived, visited southern Europe, uh, in Spain and, and uh, southern France, maybe even northern France to a certain degree, certainly Greece and Italy, you'll see old men uh, playing together, old women often together uh, doing crafts of some kind. And this set me to reminiscing about all the times throughout my life, uh, and I've spent part portions, large portions of my adult life in Southern Europe, uh, I've seen old people at play. Um, how am I running for time? Uh, I should... Shut the hell up? Is that what you said? <laughs> okay. Can I just... Um, you don't want me to read this poetry I wrote about playing in Greece? Or do you want to hear a really lousy joke? So I was just telling somebody this. A couple of weeks ago, I was, uh, my publisher had sent me to um, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, to this very you know, waspy community museum lecture series. And I, I told some stuff. I wanted to be very careful about my material. And, and I told it, and then afterwards, this very distinguished tall guy in fine looking clothes comes up to me and he says, I've got one I don't think you've heard. And I'm prepared to be bored. And 
And he says, it's a story about, he says, about the 70-year-old man who goes out to dinner with his 21-year-old wife. And as, as he's passing a table, somebody looks up at him and he yells, pedophile! Later, he's telling the story of a friend of his. He says, it ruined my whole evening. It was just awful, and we were out celebrating our 10th anniversary. <laughs> It's awful, isn't it? Yes, it's sick, sick. I'll be, thank you.